I want a drink. forget about right here sometimes because we're always like I said yesterday we're always on 
But it's so good to know that there's nothing I can say. I can say. We'll take your love away. And there's no place I can go. I can go. Where your love won't be there. And there is nothing I can do. I can do. That will make you love me more. Because your love comes as a gift. As a gift. And I only have to open it. that you love us. Thank you, Lord, that you love us. <laughs> that you forgave us. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for grace that covers, Lord. Praise you. Thank you. <laughs> glory, glory, glory to God. <laughs> Woo, yes, Jesus. Jesus, Jesus, we thank you. We love you, Lord. Sweet Jesus, sweet Jesus, we praise you, O oh Lord. We praise you, O oh Lord. Glory to God. Glory to God in the highest. You are holy and worthy, and thank you so much, Lord. Thank you so much, Lord. Thank you so much, Lord. Hallelujah. Praise you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah, Jesus. Father God, I lay before you my life, my heart, my being, all that. Spend me for your glory, my Lord. I want to bring honor to your name. Make me your servant. Your to bring honor Lord, to, bring to honor. your 
your name. Servant, come on, church. Make me your servant. Your willing servant. Your willing servant. Longing just to be to sit at your feet. long to sit at your feet, Lord, and no longer see you just as a reflection, but to see you face to face and know you and know who you are, to look into your eyes, Lord, your eyes that delivered us and saved us and set us free, Lord. Oh, we humble ourselves before you because you're so good to us. Oh, we bless your name, Lord. We long to touch you. We long to see Oh, God, forgive us, Lord, for times when we walk away from you. Forgive us, Lord, for times that we get our eyes on our ministries. Forgive us for times, Lord, that we get our eyes on church and everything about you instead of you. Oh, this morning we gaze upon you, Lord. We put our focus upon you, Lord, because you are so good. Your eyes are so compassionate. They're so wonderful. Oh God, our Father that's been so faithful, that's been so faithful, and time after time has watched us follow afar off and said, welcome home, son. Welcome home, son. Thank you, Lord. We want to serve you with everything in our hearts because you said the least in the kingdom will be the greatest. We want to serve you, Lord, and we bow our hearts before you, and we sing, I am your servant, your willing servant, yes, I am. Your willing servant. Longing just to be with you. Longing just to be with you. To sit at your feet. Spending my life. Bless the Lord. Bless the Lord. Hasn't the presence of the Lord been so sweet and precious in these services? Just a moment, we're going to move on in the service. We're going to have Big John Hall come and minister to us in song. 
We have a couple of other announcements that we need to make that's of pertinent interest to you. But before we do, I'd like to take this opportunity for everybody to just feel at home and relaxed. We want you to turn around, if you will, and take just a few minutes and shake as many hands as you can and introduce yourself and uh, let people know who you are nearby. Would you do that right now? Hallelujah. <laughs> Can you say hallelujah? hallelujah. Woo. I'm telling you, folks. You may be seated. Well, I heard y'all had a great service last night. <laughs> I tell you what, I have enjoyed having y'all here so much. I don't think I have ever in my whole life heard worship like I heard last night and uh, Tuesday night. Last night especially. I don't know if you could tell it out there or not, but up here on the platform, it was like a constant masculine buzz. Ooh like that that's what did it to me I mean I, <laughs> I got up here and that, that, that worship see what happens is when you praise you praise until worship comes and adoration and then when you begin to adore and worship the Lord then the glory falls and when y'all got into that worship last night the glory fell on me and I'll tell you what it fell on a lot of y'all too is what I heard my wife told me, she said, she walked by some pews and saw people sitting there like they was in a dunt. <laughs> you know, I know the feeling, friend. It's wonderful. And I'll tell you what, when you go back home, it's going to happen to you at home, too. So I want to, I think the purpose of this conference is to prepare you to get to go back home so you know what's going to happen to you. Amen. God's going to touch. God's going to touch so many of you when you go back home. Your life is going to be changed. Not because you've been to Brownsville Assembly. No, 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 no. No, it's nothing like that. It has nothing to do with a denomination or evangelist or pastor, nothing like that. It has nothing to do with that. It's just that when you come in the contact and the presence of the Holy Spirit in such an awesome way, it rubs off on you. You absorb that, see? It's just like pores. It just pours into the pores of your body. And then when you go back home, you're just different. We've heard that hundreds of times. You see... Since last Father's Day, June of 1995, there's been over 600,000 people through these doors. There's been over 18,500 people saved. Amen? <clears throat> let, let me try that one more time. I said there's been over 18,500 saved. Man. Think about it. <clears throat> Think about it. Glory! Woo! 18,500. Yeah. 
and friend. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. We thank you, Jesus. Let me, let me just tell you real quick a couple of things. There has been miracle after miracle after miracle. The Holy Spirit revealed to me that uh, during this, com or during this uh, revival that is going to have three stages. He said at first it would be like Israel. He gave Israel as a pattern to me, and he said that uh, whenever Moses came in with his rod to Pharaoh in among the Egyptians, that God began to do uh, relief miracles for his people. He began to deliver his people. So he sent his power to one by one, and each plague that he sent was breaking the fingers of Pharaoh off of Israel. And finally, when the 10th plague came, you remember that the, the fingers of Pharaoh was off of Israel and they were being delivered. So the Lord showed me that the first thing that's going to happen in this revival is that God is refreshing and reviving and delivering his people. And I'm telling you, I have seen it. Not just the sinners getting saved, but man, preachers, pastors' wives, evangelists, and their wives, missionaries and their wives, and staff members of churches have been delivered by the I'd say tens of thousands. They've been all, friend, listen, any denomination you can think of, they've been here. They have been here. And God has miraculously set them free. And uh, the Lord showed me that the second phase of the revival was going to be major healings, and that's already started. Uh, in the major healing part, the Lord said that as he delivered his people, Israel, from Egyptian bondage, that before he could bring them into the promised land, bring them out of uh, Egypt, into the wilderness he healed them all there wasn't one sick and the Lord revealed to me that he's going to begin to deliver his people and then the third thing is the third phase he's getting us to the place where he's going to get us ready for the promised land you know what's happening when we worship like this and whenever we come in services like this you may shake and you may have a manifestation of the Holy Spirit but manifestations and shaking and all that kind of stuff is only a byproduct because after that's over, if you don't love Jesus more, nothing's really happened to you. That's right. <clears throat> you can shake and vibrate until your bones pound the cement down here, and it's not going to change you. But if you love Jesus more, when the Lord gets through with you, then the Lord's getting you ready for the rapture. And I tell you what, a, a message came in tongues at the beginning of this revival and interpretation, and it said this. The Holy Spirit said, I'm touching you and I'm getting you introduced to the bridegroom now so when you see him in the air you won't be surprised and what's happening in these meetings is the Lord is introducing us the Holy Spirit is introducing us to Jesus afresh and anew and I love him more than I've ever loved him in my life and if I've heard that one time from preachers that's come in here from all over America and around the world and church people, we've heard that, oh, I love Jesus so much more. I know him so much better. And I want to say this, too, before we move on to the service. Uh, pastors, if you go home and you feel like you've been blessed here and you feel like you trust the leadership of this church and you would like to encourage your people to come here to Brownsville, I give you my word. We'll take care of them, and we'll pastor them while they're here. We'll watch over them. We'll love them. And... Uh, I hope you can trust us. I know it's hard to really gain a true perspective of how everything really is just in a pastor's conference because, see, you're not in revival, in our revival services, because they're completely different. This is wonderful, but revival is completely different. This is a pastor's conference you're enjoying, but revival is, it looks different. There's a different flavor to it. But uh, whenever you get home, if you'd like to encourage your people to come, we'll do our best to, to watch over them and shepherd them while they're here and uh, to pastor them. And to make sure that uh, nothing would happen that you wouldn't be comfortable with. We're trying our best to pastor this thing so God will receive the glory. And pastors can feel comfortable that whenever they come, their people's not going to get weird or anything weird's going to happen. We're really trying to keep everything in perspective, keep it biblically based and principled. And so if you'd like to encourage your people to come, I give you my word. We'll do our very best to watch over them and love them and protect them. And the other thing I'd like to say to you is there's so many miracles happening now, and I'll use the word miracles. I'd, I'd like to use the word healing because miracles is not healing. Healing is part of the atonement. 
And the Lord is doing so many healings now that they're sounding redundant. Major, it started off with brain tumors. And we got where we was hearing brain tumors being healed all the time. I mean, that was just constant. And now it's other kinds of things. And, um, for example, one man came from Alabama the other day. This is just something off the top of my head. He had a tumor behind his lung and his esophagus. It was pressing between his lung and his esophagus. And um, it, was, it was large, and it, the doctor told him, he said, listen, he said, you know, there's nothing really I can do for you. We're just going to try to keep you comfortable. So the man went to his, do went to his doctor, and he said, listen, he said, uh, I'm going to take a trip to Pensacola down there to a revival. And the doctor said, no way. You're not going nowhere. He said, that thing is so dangerous, it could rip you, and you could bleed to death. He said, well, doc, listen, you said there's nothing else you can do for me. Hey, why not give God a shot? So the man, they made him real comfortable. You know, they propped him up with pillows and everything, and they brought him down here. And he came in the services, and it's irre irregardless of who laid hands on him, if anybody laid hands on him. That's not the issue. It's not the issue if I prayed for him or Steve prayed for him or any of the workers prayed for him and nobody touched him. We've got we to remember Jesus is central here. You understand that? He's central. So we don't even know who touched him and prayed for him. We don't want to know. But uh, he came, and he said, Woo, 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 woo. Feel better. Woo, woo. You know, man, don't have no pain. Praise God. And he just, you know, he couldn't believe he didn't have any pain. Woo, woo, woo. You know, he just couldn't believe it. So then he came back the next day and he said, man, evidently I think I'm healed. I don't have a bit of pain. This is the first time in months I don't have any pain. So he went back home. And he got back home and told the doctor, he said, uh, the doctor said, well, how would you make the trip? He said, doc, I made the trip great. He said, uh, matter of fact, I don't have any pain. He said, I want you to check me out. The doc said, well, that's going to take a little time. He said, you know, don't get too excited. He said, no, I want you to check me out. So the doctor did a thorough head to toe check on him, come back out, shook his head. He said, you know I know that tumor was in there. I know it was. I know it was. So, and folks, listen, isn't it time that Jesus began to heal his church all over? Isn't it time? And we're having people delivered of mental disorders, fears, anxiety, panic attacks, depression. We're having uh, people delivered of physical diseases. I'm telling you, when I see the altar calls in this place, it so stirs my soul to see what God is doing, the multiplied thousands that are coming. They actually come here. They're drawn here like a magnet. It's like a magnet is up on the top of this church, and it just draws darkness in the centers. It just draws them. Man, sometime I've, I've seen altar calls in this place where five to 600 people would come and get saved. It would fill up the whole front and down every aisle of sinners giving their heart to Jesus. And I'm talking about prostitutes would come in here in high heels, spiked heels, and, and short hot pants on. There's not a lot of churches could handle that. You know, some people stick their nose up in the air and walk out and say, oh, my God, this church has changed. I can't go there anymore. But you know what? If a church is a hospital for sinners, why not? Why not? Hey. Hey, listen. Let me tell you something. God cleans his fish. Or God catches his fish first and then cleans them. <laughs> I almost missed it, see? God catches his fish first and then he cleans them. And so they're being drawn in here by the thousands. And I'm telling you, we, we are, we're in a bad area of town, as you can tell. Uh, people couldn't believe that I was building a, a church here like this in this locality because they said, you know, man, this is prostitutes area and pimps and, and drug addicts and all that. Pastor, why in the world are you building a church like that here? I said, hey, you know, good grief. Why not? I mean, this is where, this, this is where the people are. Are we a museum for saints or are we a soul-saving station for sinners? Come on. Is that the truth? And let me tell you something. Not long before we built this church here, a lot of, uh, well, there's another church not far from here, took up roots and moved out by the interstate. And uh, I didn't really pay that much attention to it, but whenever we started building our church, even the community, the sinners, began to say, hey, thanks for staying. Thanks for staying. You see, if light pulls up roots and moves out, darkness moves in. And I think that churches sometimes make mistakes when they pull up and move out and put the light out 
you know, they put the candle out, move out on the interstate. Who are we trying to impress? And I'll tell you something, I believe Jesus is real pleased with this church being right here. And I'll tell you something else, too. You might think that a church being a locality like this, that they'd come by with spray paint cans and write graffiti all over the place and break in, they don't even touch the place. You know why? They're proud of it. They're proud of it. This community's proud of this church being here, and I'm proud we're here. This is our roots. We've been here over 50 years. This is our fifth building program. Church started in 1939. I'm only its eighth pastor since 1939. I've been here 14 years, and I plan on being here to the rapture if Jesus tarries that long. And if not, I plan on growing old and gray here. Or just growing old here. <laughs> well, I just wanted to say to you, though, that I, we, have, we have loved having y'all here so much. It's been such a joy having all of y'all here. And let me tell you something else. I, I, I've really come to love y'all so much and enjoy having you here and your praise and worship so much. I got an idea. Why don't y'all just stay? And I'll take up an offer and every night and pay your expenses for being here. How's that? I'd love it. I never, <laughs> I never have heard worship like I heard the last two nights in my life. It, it was like a roar. You ever come up to a, a railroad crossing and, and a thing comes down in front of your car and you're sitting there and that train goes by and you feel your car wobbling and you feel that roar? Up here on the platform, it felt like something come down like this, and man, I mean the worship in this place. I was looking around for angels when I get my eyes open. I was looking around for angels in this place. I didn't know what was going to happen next, but it's just been a delight to have you. A good friend of mine, pastor that's back this church and back this revival here in Pensacola, Dan Livingston, and many of you saw him on TBN. He was on there talking about our revival. The handsome guy, he's about 74 years old. His hair, he's still got his hair. Uh, come on up, Dan. Can you make it? Need some help? This is Dan Livingston. I told him back there, I said, I used to have high respect for him till he hit that gray part. I used to think he was this awesome man of God, and he just got in the flesh. <laughs> well, we love Brother John, and uh, the whole church here, I don't have to tell you, they're just phenomenal people. And uh, I, I want to confirm something he said earlier. I, I want to say this as a local church here in the town, about 15 minutes away, that you can send your people here, and they will be taken care of. And uh, I encourage my people every service get in the revival. We canceled our whole calendar. We cleared it for the year uh, so that we would have nothing to keep our people from coming to this river. And uh, we just cleared the calendar. And I tell my people every Sunday, go, go, go. We have special prayer for Brother John and Steve and the staff and the singers here. Every service in our church, we have a special prayer for the anointing of God to fall. This isn't my revival, your revival. This is God's wind blowing. And... Uh, it has changed. My life has been changed. My family's been changed. Uh, my church has been changed. And uh, this is all of us together, folks. And I, I tell my people, I tell them, if God lays on your heart to go Wednesday night or Sunday morning, go. Bring back. If, that, if God burdens you and you feel to go, go get whatever God's wanting to give you and bring it back. And they do. And we're having, last night was the most awesome presence of God that we've had in our church was last night. I mean, worship, you talking worship. Man, God dropped me to my gut on the floor. Man, just wailing. Worship. You know, just wor no burden, just worship. You know, and uh, if you get in the river and quit worrying about where you... Listen, if your people leave you over one thing, they'll leave you over anything. Don't worry about it, man. Just love God with whoever's there. Amen. If they're going to leave me, I'd rather them come here. <laughs> just send their ties. Just keep my paycheck coming on Friday, man. I ain't worried about it. But isn't it wonderful to be together in ministry? You know, preachers are the most insecure people in the world. All right, I, I'm supposed to make an announcement. I'll make it. I can say that because I am one. Well, you think we're secure? Let somebody leave your church. 
We'll spend three weeks trying to find out why they left. Well, glory. But when the river starts flowing, you don't care. Not that you don't care about the people. You just want to love Jesus. I tell you, I am freer in Jesus than ever before in my life, man. I, I don't have to build a big church. I don't feel any pressure to be successful. I wake up every day to do one thing now, and that's love Jesus. Man, just love Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We wanted to let you know, we mentioned this. I asked Pastor Jim to come. Pastor Jim's one of the associates at our church there, and he's over our youth. Phenomenal guy, and it's amazing how God's just connected him and Brother Richard here with their youth wherever he went over there. And the little quiet guy over there that never moves around and never hear anything out of him. But uh, we, God has just connected our two churches, and that's one of the great miracles how churches in our city not just us two, but many churches God has brought together in this revival. But we're having our second annual, we call it PK and Youth Conference, coming up in June the 24th through the 28th. And it's a special week as God is moving among pastors and people here. We felt a real need to minister to the young people and especially to the preacher's kids. And uh, I have two children of my own. Pastor Jim has children. And uh, so June the 24th through the 28th of this year will be our second conference and the Monday and Tuesday will be for preacher's kids and missionary kids only. That the minister's children will be brought in and they're not going to be preached at because they hear that every week. They're going to be loved. They're going to be encouraged. They're going to be strengthened. They're going to have a lot of fun. And it's just two days that we're going to pump into your children and let them know that it is an honor to be a preacher's kid. Not a burden. Not a job. God chose you specifically to be a preacher's kid. And we're going to invest into them the joy of being a child of a preacher and that it is not a negative it's an extreme positive and then the rest of the week will be open for your youth and so I just want Pastor Jim very quickly just give you an update of what's going to happen Brother Steve Hill is going to be one of the speakers and we're going to be bringing them over here for one of the night services there's going to reserve room for them and we're believing God that your young people are going to go back with the river and it just flow into your youth and into your schools there praise God I want to say, and most of you know, you'll remember when this conference started on Tuesday evening, there was a special emphasis, and Pastor Kilpatrick and others felt that the Lord was trying to bring families together. And of the majority of people that's in this building now, all of you are pastors or missionaries or evangelists or staff members, and God wants to minister to your family. You live in the proverbial fishbowl, and you know that. And everybody looks at what's happening in your family. It puts a lot of pressure on your children and some of it is is realized and other times they don't even know where it's coming from but they just know something's different and I grew up in a pastor's home and several of my friends that I stay in contact with you know we walk through some of that and we were PKs before Bill McCartney of Promise Keepers ever knew what a PK was and uh, but we want to minister to your children and I believe that this is going to be just a powerful powerful time for your children, for the youth of your church. I have already started encouraging all of our youth. Pastor Richard has done the same, I think, for his. And between our two groups, we'll probably have about 300 kids already. Um, I encourage you strongly to pick up a brochure and fill it out, give it to us, and we'll get some more information to you about this conference. I've encouraged all of them. In a meeting like this, you know the difficulty of sometimes even standing for hours upon hours to receive prayer but if you're hungry you'll stay and let me encourage you to do that if you've been leaving to hit Shoney's please stick around and receive prayer um, but I told my group last evening that brother Steve is going to come over and kick it off for everybody on Wednesday morning and we're going to have a time of prayer I've already mentioned to brother Richard that we've secured some of the facilities around town for recreation but at the same time I said it would be awesome if we had to cancel those things because our kids are in the altars. Amen. And it would thrill my heart to absolute pieces if I could look around and call Dreamland Skate and say, we can't be there, all of our kids are praying. <laughs> Hallelujah. The ages are between 12 and 18. And so if you have children, pastors, your children will be Monday and Tuesday only. There won't be any other kids here during that time. Pastors, missionaries, evangelists, staff members, your children on Monday and Tuesday only. There's going to be a lot of activity and a lot of fun, and we're going to love them. 
on Wednesday through Friday. It will be open to all people. They will experience revival here. They will experience revival at our place on Wednesday morning. We'll have special music and a lot of things going on. Make plans to attend. There's some brochures that will be on the back table. Please pick one up. Thank you. During the revival, we mainly just have the worship here at Brownsville Assembly, so it's always a real treat for us when we have people come by like Big John Hall. And um, I saw him at Springfield when I was up there addressing the ministers back in, uh, I think it was March. He was talking about revival, and afterwards I ran into John, and he said, man, he said, I'm thinking about coming to your ministers' conference. I said, oh, you've got to come. And I said, by the way, while you're there, sing for us. You, you just can't have Big John Hall in the place without having him sing. Would you welcome, please, Big John Hall. Thank you so much. After the service last night, uh, David Stevenson and I were visiting and talking about the service and how wonderful it was. We thought, well, the key must have been the way Pastor Kilpatrick handled the service <laughs> last night. <laughs> the first time in my life I've ever had a pastor say, well, I heard you, I enjoyed it, but I couldn't see you. <laughs> Revival is wonderful. It's not by might. It is not by power. It is not by great vocal performance. It is not great speaking, but it is by my spirit. By my spirit, saith the Lord. The anointing of the Lord breaks the yoke of bondage, sets the captives free. Folks, he has declared that our prison door is open. It will walk out. Turn me on, brother. The anointing breaks the yoke. The anointing of the Lord breaks the yoke of bondage. The anointing of the Lord sets the captives. The anointing of the Lord brings rivers to your desert. That anointing is raining on me. That anointing is raining on me. It's not by eloquence or talent that God's work is done. Not by might nor by power, but it's by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. Receive his word for you this very hour. the captives free, the anointing of the Lord brings rivers to your desert, that anointing is raining on me, that anointing is The Lord brings rivers to your desert that a morning is raining on me. That a 
Me and Steve were just sitting there wondering what he sounded like when he was three years old. <laughs> Steve, <laughs> Steve said, I wonder when he was three years old and cried, I wonder what he sounded like. to break the flow of the anointing. I was just wondering about that. <laughs> we have a, a delightful guest with us also this morning. We have one final song before our evangelist comes. Bruce Haynes is a songwriter and singer. His dad pastors in Branson, Missouri, Brother Jerry Haynes. And uh, Bruce has sung for us now in our revival services several times, and he sings his own works, and he just does a superb job. I'd like for you to give a good welcome to Bruce Haynes.
Hallelujah. Brother Bruce Haynes, he was the country music uh, male vocalist of the year for three years in a row. And uh, he's Christian country is what he is, Christian country. And uh, I like that wing. I like that wing he's got. You look at him, you don't think he got that wing. That music cranks up, that whang comes out, brother. I love that whang you got. Amen. You don't look like you got no whang, though. <laughs> Just sitting there. But it's good. <laughs> well, hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Brother. <laughs> okay. Brother Steve Hill came here on Father's Day and was supposed to be here for one service only. He's going to be here for Father's Day night, as a matter of fact. And uh, he came, and I asked him, I said, man, I can't, Sunday morning is just rough for me right now. My mother just died, and I said, would you preach for me on Sunday morning and Sunday night? And he said, sure. So, man, he came in, I'm telling you, that morning. He, he, was, he was like a, a stallion in a stall. He was up here and he's preaching, and I never seen him like that because we've been friends for years, and he's preached for me quite a number of times. And uh, every time Steve would come and preach, he'd mainly preach on Sunday nights down through the years, and I'd always leave and go home and tell Brenda. I said, Brenda, what is it? I said, I know that guy. I said, man, he's passionate for souls. I said, and he preaches, and we just have a regular service. I said, I don't understand it. I said, man, I feel the power of God when that old boy preaches. I said, we just have a normal service. But God just kept everything in check until that extraordinary service on Father's Day. But Steve had been mightily touched. God had anointed him tremendously in January before he came here in June. And the morning he got up to preach, he was preaching, and he was just stomping behind the pulpit like this, lifting his feet and his legs, you know. And I thought, man, all right, all right, calm down. It's Father's Day, you know. <laughs> Praise God. We've got to get out of here in a few minutes and go eat lunch with our daddies. We'll come back tonight and we'll shout tonight, you know. It didn't work out like that, friend. He said, I'll tell you, folks, in just a few minutes, I'm going to pray. And he said, God's going to touch you. God's going to touch you. And I said, all right, okay, yeah, calm down, man. So finally he got through preaching. He preached a few minutes. And he said, all right, those of you that want prayer, come forward. A thousand people jumped up and come forward. I said, my God. <laughs> uh, Jesus, have mercy. We'll never get out of here. <clears throat> Because, <laughs> you know, like I said, man, I was out of it. I lost my mother, and I was emotionally wrenched out, and just a whole bunch of things going on. I knew revival was about to break out in the church. I knew that. The Holy Spirit had shown me, and I'd lost about 30 people uh, right during that period of time. And I had the roughest week I ever had in 14, 13 years at that time of being here as pastor. And so whenever Steve said, come on up for prayer, you know, about 1,000 people lunged forward, and I said, well, you know. So I walked down off the steps over here with him to help pray. He started praying on this side of the church, and I walked down over there with him and just sort of put my hand on his back and laid my hand on this guy's head that we was praying for. And uh, I got to feeling a little funny, you know. <laughs> I said, hmm. <laughs> all right, all right. And about that time, that breeze came through the back of my legs. I said, whoo <laughs> So old Tony Taylor, you always says right down here on the front, he's a bouncer in a bar, and he got saved in our ministry here. And, and uh, he looked at me, and <clears throat> when the wind blew through my legs, <clears throat> I did, my knees didn't buckle, but my ankles flipped, just like that right there. <laughs> just like that. I was standing there. So about that time, a, a lady fell in front of me. That hurts. <laughs> a lady fell in front of me, and uh, I couldn't get my leg up to step over. And I said, man, something in this place. <laughs> You know, and uh, Tony Taylor looked at me and said, you okay? I said, I don't know, man. <laughs> so uh, he come over and he said, you need some help? I said, I guess so. <laughs> so I'm still standing like this, you know. <laughs> so, <laughs> hey, brother, God's got a sense of humor, amen? <clears throat> he said, I'm going to fix that preacher up. So old Tony grabbed me by the knees and my pants legs like this, and he, he walked me up on the pant he walked me up on the platform like this. Just like this right here. Is 
just like that. <clears throat> and I come up here and leaned on the platform like this. And I said, folks, this is it. Get in. <laughs> and man, about that time, Steve walked right by in front of the pulpit. He never touched me. He just looked up at me and said, more Lord. And I said, wow. And there's a place up here, isn't there, Dick Rubin? There's a place right here. We're charging $500 a pop. Right here. <laughs> there's, a, <laughs> there's a place right here, folks, where every time it seems like the Lord mightily touches me, I mean, I, this is where I went down. And uh, later, several other things happened. We won't get into that. But uh, I mean, I was down from 12.30 to 4 o'clock. And this church and in my life has never been the same since. So we had been praying for revival, and I knew revival was coming. But you know, sometime you can be so close to a miracle yet so far away. The disciples is in the boat, but they're just on the wrong side of the boat. How wide can a boat be? 15 feet, they were 15 feet away from a miracle. The Lord said, pull up your lines and set them on the other side of the boat. You'd be so close to a miracle. Jacob said, he was asleep, woke up, and he said, the presence of the Lord was here, the glory of the Lord was here, and I knew it not. Samson said, when the glory departed from him, he said, the glory has departed, and I knew it not. So the Lord can be among you, and you not know it, and it can leave you, and you not know it. That's why you have to always... Keep your finger in the wind and be very conscious of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Would you please welcome my dear friend, one of the most passionate preachers that I have ever heard in my life for souls. By the way, come early tonight because we're going to have to open up all these facilities for sinners that are coming and, and people that are coming from all over America. They're coming from all over, and they're here on top of the conference. Uh, crowd, so we're going to open up the church tonight. It's not just going to be reserved seating just for the ministers, but anybody can come in because last night we had a lot of people leaving, so we want to tell you to get here early and get you a good seat because so many people left last night. We also want to have some sinners in here because Brother Steve's going to be preaching both this morning and tonight, so we want you to get here early and get you a good seat, and uh, we'd really appreciate that. Would you please welcome Reverend Steve Hill. Hello, everyone. Bless the Lord. A couple of things. Those of you that um, have just built your church on the side of the interstate, you know, we were just talking a few minutes ago about leaving out of the inner city. That may have been God moving you, so don't, don't take that as a critical remark. I believe God leads every church. It, but if, if, you had, um, if you have left the inner city and gone to the suburbs, don't forget the inner city. Okay, because you can reach the inner city from the suburbs. But just don't forget the inner city. God will bless you as you remember them. Hallelujah. Another thing I'd like to share with you, we have not touched on, and, and when this revival first broke out, we spent a lot of time talking about uh, manifestations because people didn't understand them. Uh, I have an extensive library back in Texas and just thousands of books, and most of them are, are hundreds of years old, so I can't travel with them. They're very brittle. They're leather books and from revivals of years gone by. Some of them are actually manuscripts that were written during the revivals, uh, the Methodist magazines, copies of Methodist magazines from 1813, 1814, and they're, they're brittle, and you can't carry them around with you. And, and, but, but in them, I've, I've always studied revivals, and you read, as you read what went on, all the things that we see in these revivals have always gone on. So what you saw last night, what you're going to see tonight, the teenagers that are shaking under the power of God, falling under the power, they're falling in the high schools under the power, they're being filled with the Holy Ghost and then asking what it was. We're having that happen. We're having people call the church and ask the church what this is coming out of their mouth. They were prayed for, they got filled with the Holy Ghost, and they didn't know what it was. And so things like that are happening, and it's always taken place, friends, in years gone by. 
And so uh, when, when it first broke out, we were explaining some of those things about Charles Finney, the waves. Those of you that have read his journals, please read his, his journals. He had people falling under the power, Presbyterians, Methodists, all the time. And Charles, these, these are documented, okay? You, you get the old books, don't get the revised. Get the books that actually have not changed. You know, some folks have put out some of this literature and they took out what they wanted to take out and, and, and kept in what they wanted to keep in. No, get his writings and you'll see the waves of electricity shot through Charles Finney. It just waves, he said, which kept shooting through his body. And he, and, and he said, God, I can't take this anymore. Some of you are, have experienced that in this revival. Just the power of God kept coming down. You, you, you go, no more, Lord. Then you're going, more, Lord. No more, Lord. No, yes, no, because it's so good, but you don't know how much you can stand. Anyway, this has always gone on, friends, and we're not going to spend a lot of time on it. But um, I asked one of our local bookstore, the Gospel Lighthouse uh, bookstore, if they would order some copies of Like as a Fire. These are the actual Azusa Street papers, okay? These are phenomenal. These are, these are the actual copies of the papers. They are full of typos. They're just the way Brother Seymour sent them out. And uh, I have highlighted in here, stuff took place, friends. I mean, this was totally out of control. It was so good, man. And it was just, people came from all over the world. Sometimes Brother Seymour didn't even show, he was a pastor, you would relate to the man. Sometimes he didn't even show up. He would go out under the power or just be off somewhere seeking God and the place would be flooded with people. Everybody was receiving miracles and no one was in charge but Jesus. And, um, and I want to encourage you, they have 175 copies of these. These are hard to come by. They're $16.95, and when they told me, I had my secretary just call them, ask how much they were selling them for, I thought, and when they, she said $16.95, that's what the publishing company sells them for. And I'm going, well, how did they, so they, evidently they got them for a few bucks less, and I can tell you right now, Gospel Lighthouse is not getting rich on this. They're doing this for you, and so I'm going to give you the address, but, uh, and you'll have time, they're only 10 minutes from here. Okay, and I want to encourage you to go by there rather than us drag them all in here. Just go by there It's called like as of fire the Azusa Street papers and you'll have a great time reading that and here is They're at 310 North Navy Boulevard 310 North Navy Boulevard Ask any of our ushers how to get over there and they will help you out It'll only take you 15 minutes to go over there and back or about 20 minutes to get over there and back Just pick up a copy of this Hallelujah That'll confuse me. Get that out of my sight. No, that's not you. <laughs> hey, one of you pick up John Kilpatrick a copy. Who will pick him up a copy of that? Thank you, brother. Pick him up a copy. Hallelujah. Pay for it, too, now. <laughs> Hallelujah. One of the mistakes that I believe was made during the Azusa Street Revival is a lot of folks were filled with the Holy Ghost and uh, they went and the, the language was, um, was uh, identified by some, some of the adherents, the folks that went to the revival. And so they sent that person. They put, you know, put all their belongings in a casket and sent them off to that country to preach the gospel because the tongues that they got in that revival, they felt like that was the language for that mission field and it didn't work out that way for most of them. So... Um, there, there are, you will read some things like that that took place and they just wrote about it. This, and what's so beautiful about Like as a Fire is those are unedited. That's exactly what was going on and I eat that up, friends, because it's, it's, it hasn't been gleaned over and stuff taken out. This is just what the revival was. I want to speak to you, if you're turning your silly bus to, um, <laughs> to this page right here, the page after my picture. It's syllabus. I'm sorry. <laughs> I thought it was silly bus. But if you would um, turn to uh, the time to reap has come. For the next 35, 40 minutes, I'd like to talk to you about giving the altar call. Before going any further, I'd like to make a statement to every evangelist. Everyone, if you'd look at me right now. Evangelists and pastors, everyone listen to this. Evangelists, if you're in this room and you think you have authority when you go to the local church, you are wrong. 
This revival is under the leadership of John Kilpatrick. He is the head of this church. I am submitted to that man. And I won't do anything unless, as a matter of fact, we've already discussed today some of the things about tonight. And I've told the ushers. The usher said, Steve, what should we do? And I said, when I get with the pastor, he'll make the final decision and we'll decide what to do tonight and together we'll come up with an idea. Everything flows. That's one of the reasons this revival will go on for a long time, friend. Because everyone knows their place. And evangelists, if you think you're going to go into a church and take control of the situation, you might as well stay home. You're missing God. That's one of the reasons the miracles are not happening. That's one of the reasons the offerings are down for you. That's one of the reasons things don't work out the way you want them to work out because you don't have the blessings of God. The blessings of the Lord is not with you. Evangelist, you are under the leadership of that local pastor. Now, when I go out, I'm a church planter. I will go out and plant churches around the world. I hold the revival meetings. I set up the tent. I preach. I am in control of that. I call all the shots. Not in a situation like this. As an apostle, as a church planter, I plant the church. I set it all up. As an evangelist in the local church, he's in charge. Get that straight. And pastor, I want to tell you something else. If you have an evangelist come your way that has any inclination to lean towards the leadership part of it, tell him you don't have no use for him. Tell him that over the phone, not before he gets there. Tell him you have absolutely no use for his services. Take care of the problems before he ever comes. Okay? Can everybody, how many agree with that? Amen. Friend, I want to tell you. It is, one of the things that people cannot believe is how well we get along together. We've known each other for 14 years, but I'm not here to, to, to do anything but preach the word, bring in souls. He's here to pastor the revival. We know our place. How many know when somebody gets out of their place, that's when all hell breaks loose? So remember that. Evangelists, remember that. In a love, I'm, I'm trying to speak to you lovingly, but some of you have blown it in the past, and you know you have. You stepped into a situation, and you've said things that you shouldn't have said. You stepped in, and, uh, um, and when people come to you, before moving on here, when people come to you, if you're doing an extended meeting, and the members of the congregation come to you, and they say, well, you know, uh, John Kilpatrick, or the pastor says this about this, uh, what do you say? They start getting that wedge between the two. You better watch out, brother. That's taking the finger out of the dike right there. If I don't know the answer right then, I'll say, you know something? I think I'll get together with the pastor and talk about that. As a matter of fact, why don't both you and I go right now and talk to the pastor? <laughs> and what they're going to they're find a cord, man, a strong braided cord, impossible to break, and they'll either yield or leave. But you try to... Oh, I, I could go on and on about this, friend. It breaks my heart to see what's happened. I would like to encourage every one of you. We have a tape on our tape table back there. And, and uh, by the way, uh, all the, the, the merchandise, and that's what a lot of this is. It's merchandise. I'm not going to say uh, it's anything else. It's stuff that you can buy with your money. But the reason that stuff is out there, friend, is because people have been begging for it. They have been begging for it. And we're not here marketing the gospel. But people have come up and said, like the Allison video, we get requests in from around the world. Charisma Magazine is fixing to put out. And in there, they've already, they haven't even published this article, and they're already getting requests for the Allison video. People have gotten bootleg copies of the article, and they want the Allison video. Why? Because when it's shown, the power comes down. Charisma showed it. For, to 225 staff members and a morning prayer session. The power of God fell. They didn't get out, the, out till 2 or 3 in the afternoon. The sessions usually last 30 minutes. One church of 4,000 members in Jacksonville put it on one Sunday morning. The pastor was hit by the power of God right on his pulpit. The people went into intercession and wailing for hours in that church. So I want to encourage you to get some of this literature. And one of the one of the tapes that we have on our table was last pastor's conference. I spoke on how to keep an evangelistic focus. How to keep an evangelistic focus. And I spoke on these four points. On, on giving the altar call, on preparing the net, on casting the net, on drawing the net, and repairing the net. I preached on that last time, and, I, and I'm not going to go through it tonight, today because I'm going to speak on the harvest. I'll be covering it from a different angle, but please get that tape. It'll do you good. I, I, have, 
I have been fortunate to be around some great evangelists. The greatest that I know is Carlos Anacondia in Argentina. I'd never in my life seen any man. He's a layman. He owns a nuts and bolts factory in Argentina. He's led two million people to the Lord. He knows something about altar calls. And I'd watch him give an altar call and cry all the way through it. I've never seen a man in my life cast the net, pull it in. Cast the net, pull it in. Cast the net, pull it in. He wouldn't let one minnow loose. I mean, they'd all be pulled in. The man was phenomenal. So I've, I've been able to glean a lot of things over the years. And then also you glean a lot from just experience. So if you turn with me in your syllabus, the time to reap has come. Say not ye, there are yet four months, and then cometh harvest. Behold, I say to you, lift up your eyes and look on the fields, for they are white already to harvest. Let's read that next paragraph. Once the eminent philosopher John Dewey found his son in his bathroom. The floor was flooded. The professor began thinking, trying to understand the situation. After working a few minutes, the son said, Dad, this is not the time to philosophize. It is time to mop. Friends, it is time to reap. It is time to pull in the harvest. It's time to go for it, friend. This is not something. This is a year of the favor of the Lord. One of the things that you're going to leave out of here with is an evangelistic anointing. Pastors, listen to these words. It's going to come out of you. It's going to come out of you mysteriously. You're going to feel it, and you're going to suddenly hear things from the Lord. He's going to speak to you about people that are out there, and you go, dear God, is that you? He's going to say, yes, it's me. Pull that fish in. Bring him in. You're going to feel it, friend. Tonight in the service, you're going to see what I'm talking about. Hundreds upon hundreds of people come to these services that are unsaved. But there are hundreds that come that have known the Lord and are backslid. There are hundreds that come that were our choir members. They're Sunday school teachers, but they don't know the Lord. We had a Sunday school teacher say the other day, teaches in one of our prominent churches, he confessed to a hideous sin. He's teaching your children. And I want to tell you, Pastor, you would have missed it. You would have missed it. Why? Because a sinner looks like a certain type of person. Boy. Mm. I'm convinced I don't know what a sinner looks like anymore. Whew. Just a point about this revival. There's so much to cover. We're going to cover some more tomorrow morning with questions and answers. Those of you that have questions coming to you, just jot them down. We're going to cover them tomorrow. But um, in this revival, you'll notice that we're not time conscious. And as the weekend comes around, it is phenomenal around here, friends. You would not believe what takes place for these weekend meetings. Because sinners come out of the woodwork. They come, man. They'll come walking right out of the street right off the streets. We've had two punk rock gangs saved. We've had Senate pastors shared. We've also had, where's, where's um, uh, Brother Lowell? You here tonight? Lowell? Where's he at? Brother Lowell! Come here. He's out there. He's working somewhere. Somebody go get him. But he's a banker that came here. He's a banker that came to get his wife out of the revival. From North Georgia, owns the bank, you know, major, major player. He came, he got, matter of fact, he was pulled over several times by the police coming down. That's how fast he wanted to get down here and get his wife out of the revival. Where are you at, brother? Come here. Come on, man. Come on, I just want them to see a real live person here. Is he gone? He's gone. I'll introduce him tonight. He's here. But he came to the revival, stood right back where Brother uh, Elmer's uh, at, he came to the rival to get his wife out, came to this meeting to, to pull her out of this cult. And uh, it's an incredible story, friends. As a matter of fact, the news journal, the secular newspaper, just covered it because it's, you know, one of your more uh, affluent individuals. It was a Saul of Tarsus experience. Right back in that corner, he was thrown down by the power of God, repented, gave his life to Jesus. His whole life was changed. I mean, everything changed. 
He quit drinking, he quit smoking, he quit cussing, and he, he got so beside himself. He got so beside himself, friend, that uh, and he, he's a major player in the banking industry, and he would, he would have folks come to him with contracts, and, and, and they would lay these contracts around, you know, the round table, you know, the business table, and they'd lay them all out there, and, or a man would come and say, listen, uh, let's talk about this, you know, th uh, $3 million uh, loan here, and, and before, he go, bless God, let's just go get a drink and talk about it down at the bar. But now, I mean, a heathen will come in with that contract. He'll go, let's get on our knees. <laughs> the guy is radical, man. He got saved. He got saved. He got saved. He got saved. But one of the characteristics of this revival, a Catholic woman came. And uh, pastors, those of you who try to cut the revival off early, you know, just nip it. You're going to miss some of the greatest experiences. Some of the greatest salvations take place later on into the night. Listen to me. But one Catholic lady told me right over here, she came up to me, and she said the reason this revival is being visited by hundreds of thousands of people from around the world and will continue to do so is because you care about us. She said nobody, she was crying when she said it. She said nobody cares about us. She said nobody spends time with anybody anymore. But I know I can come to your revival with my friends and we don't have to leave. We can stay here. We'll be prayed for. We'll be loved on. We'll be talked to. Listen to what I'm saying, pastors. This business of, you know, hurry up, God. It's over. It is over. Well, let's turn to the notes. Write down before looking over the land before a few points, and I'm going to go through these very, very quickly, friend. I will be finished in a half hour. But, um... And I mean that. I want you to write this down. This is concerning the altar call. Start giving the altar call when the revival breaks out and you mean start giving it at the very beginning of your preaching. That's when you begin giving the altar call. You tell people what you're going to tell them, then you tell them, then you tell them what you told them. That's good teaching. You tell them what you're going to tell them, then you tell them, then you tell them what you told them. You let people know at the very beginning, some of you, are sitting in this church. You are so far from God. You've wandered in this place or someone has brought you to this church tonight and you're sitting there and it's, you don't have a clue about what's going on, but God's brought you here and in just a few minutes, something great is going to happen to you. Did you hear what I'm saying? As you do that, they start, it starts churning in their hearts. In just a few minutes, something great is going to happen to me. In just a few minutes. Then you say, now listen to the message tonight. It's for you. God will speak to your heart. Just listen to it. And friend, you've already got that person. Some of them are ready to jump up within the first five minutes and come down to the altar. Start, you just put that at the very beginning of the notes. Start giving the altar call at the beginning. Number one, looking over the land. I put there, know the congregation. Know this about your congregation, that you do not know your congregation. All right? Pastors, if you tell me you know your congregation, you are wrong. I've been with them all my life. Well, that's part of the problem. You think you know your people. We think we knew some great evangelists at Vail. We think we knew this. We think we knew that. You don't know your people. You don't know what's going on inside a man's heart. You don't know that the man that is ushering in your church is not involved in some pornographic cesspool outside. You don't know what's going on in the secret of his own home. So you don't know your congregation. I'm not talking about just when revival breaks out because a lot of folks will visit. And of course you don't know them, but I'm talking about, friends, the people right in the church. Every night as I look over this church, I see a different group of people some nights there seems to be such hunger and, 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 and tenderness. It's like, a, it's like a, a congregation ready for the seed of the Word of God. And other times I look out here, friends, and it's hard as rock. There's times, friends, we come into these meetings, and I turn to pastor, he turns to me and goes, Dear God, what's going on in this place? And what the Lord is showing us, because the night before, all heaven came down. But tonight... Lyndall tries to worship. Lyndall tries to lead in praise, and they go up and they go down and cut it. They're not there, man. Something's going on. God is showing us, friend. He does that. 
I'm convinced that the Lord is allowing us to experience the fact that we don't know the people. We don't know what's going on in their lives. We don't have any earthly idea what they've been through that day. You cannot cookie cut a revival. You with me? Do you understand that, friend? You do not know the congregation. So know that, that you can't know it. Does that make any sense at all to anybody? That's one thing I've learned. The second thing is cleaning the field. Or Carlos and Nakonia call this busting rocks and getting dirty. Busting rocks and getting dirty. He told me, Carlos in Argentina, he said, Steve, what I love more than anything else is hardcore evangelism. And he said, it's busting rocks and getting dirty. Busting rocks. As you start preaching, pastors, now these are, this is for those of you when revival breaks out. Let me tell you, the refreshing that's going on in the church today is marvelous. I'm all for it. But it will die as quickly as it came. Stay with me, pastors. It will. Why? Because he that winneth souls is wise. Jesus wants a larger family. God wants you to win people to Jesus. So when you're, you're going to go back to your church, you're going to pray for folks, and heaven's going to come down. I know that's going to happen. But don't live in that every single day. Let them be prayed for. Let them be blessed. Let them get their socks blessed off. And then talk to them about the famine in the land. Talk to them about the hunger, the people out there that need just a touch of what they've gotten. And because they're so refreshed, because they're so ready, they'll begin talking to their neighbors. They'll talk to their workers at, at work. They'll talk to their, their fellow students. Do you understand that? It's, we've gone wrong in America with this, friend. That's why the refreshing has gotten so much criticism. It's been criticized, and rightly so, and rightly so. I've had pastors come here and say, Brother, heaven came down in my church for a year. It was wonderful, but I just had 200 members leave. Want to know why? Death, man. How much can you get refreshed? How much do you need, man? It's like some of us go to Barnhill's buffet and we're just, <laughs> just eating all day, just eating, eating, eating. You sit there for a few minutes more and you eat and you eat and you eat and you eat and you eat. How much can you handle without going out and doing some exercise? Go out and work a little bit. Get out in the fields and work a little bit. And then the refreshing will be that much more. Does it make sense, friends? I preached one night on... We'll work for food. You've seen them signs, we'll work for food. If you don't work, you don't eat, friend. If you want a touch from God, go out and go to work. There's nothing like a long, hard day in the fields of the Lord. Then you come to the revival meeting, man. You know, your church members are going to experience this if you'll teach them this. If they want the blessings of God to come down on them, Go out there and work for a while. Talk to people about Jesus. There's nothing like sitting in a revival meeting with a, a neighbor that doesn't know the Lord. And to know that pastor or the evangelist is going to give them the opportunity. He's not going to stand up there and go, be blessed, be blessed, be blessed. Blessing, 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 blessing. They're sitting there in sin. They don't know God. They're adulteresses. They're pornographers. They don't know the Lord. They're into drugs. And someone's up there talking about Christians. Come, Christians. Receive more Christians. Well, if that's what you're teaching all the time, friend, that's what, you're going to reap the results of it. But if you want the sinners to start coming, you want God to start pushing them in, bringing them in, you start preaching the cross, the blood, repentance, brokenness. You start preaching that, and you watch what the Lord will do. He's behind that. He's behind that. Cleaning the field. This has to do, friends. Boy, I'm right on time. Busting rocks. Let me look at me. This is what it, this is what it has to do with. When you're going to see tonight, when people come in, we're going to have people from all over the world here. They come from all over the United States to get saved. We had a lady the other night drove from New York City to get saved. Got saved in the meeting. Had a witch come from Minneapolis. Got saved right here. A witch. Why? Because they've heard 
They've read in the New York Times. They've looked at emails. They've heard that the power of God is moving in Pensacola. And they're going to hear the same thing about your church, that there is a power moving there in North Atlanta right now. Over 4,000 conversions in a Baptist church. Why? They're preaching the blood. They're preaching the cross. They're preaching hope. But when these people come in, you got to bust some rocks. And I'll begin doing this. I do this every night. I'll bust rocks like this. Some of you have no earthly idea what's going on in here. And you're doubting a lot of the stuff that's going on in here. That's a big old boulder of doubt. And I'll take a sledgehammer at the beginning of the meeting. I'll go, whoo I'll hit that boulder and just disintegrate it. And, and I'll say, listen, if you're here and you don't understand what's going on, that's okay. Relax. And that hill melts like wax in the presence of the Lord. Just relax. You don't have to do anything. All I want you to do is listen. See what I'm doing, friends? You're starting to get the congregation ready. You're cleaning the field, man. You're cleaning their heart. You're cleaning the field of all these rocks, all these trees, all these, those of you tonight, I'll say something like this. Those of you in the service that are from a religious background, a religious background, religion will damn you to hell. Religion is the opiate of the masses. It was said well. America is suffering from that opiate, that drug, that disease called religion. And I said, you're in this place, you've been in church all your life, and this is the first time to be in such a service where you feel it's so different. And see, as you say that, that person's sitting there, friend. They're going, man, he's reading my mind. What's he going to say next? Then you say, it's okay. You need to thank the Lord that he brought you here because that shows how much he loves you, and he wants to take you in a whole new realm in your Christian walk. And suddenly that rock, that boulder of what's going on in this place is just, does anyone understand what I'm talking about? I'm giving the altar call. I'm giving the altar call from the very beginning, this third point. And we don't have a lot of time to go through every one of these friends. Turning the soil. Break up the fallow ground. Take time to turn the soil all the way through your message. Fallow ground is ground that has not been tilled or turned for at least a year. It's hard soil. Well, if you, pastors, if you come up here and preach, and I'm not, this is not a how-to, but these are just some points we've learned in this revival. Sinners come running to the altar for some reason. And I think it's because a lot of their soil, their hearts have been prepared. They come into this service, and their hearts, I told you last night about the natural heart. It's crusty. It's hard. It's full of unbelief. They come in here, and, and I see that. You can read it on their faces. Pastors, how many of you know what I'm talking about? You can see the hardness on their faces. Well, what good is it to scream and holler at them if you don't deal with that rock hard soil first? And you say things like this. This is how you turn the soil. You say, friend, it doesn't matter how you got here. I don't care if somebody paid you to come here. God brought you here. He brought you here because he loves you. And a lot of times I'll weep. I'm not ashamed to cry. And I'll cry and I'll, they'll, look at, they'll look at the tears coming out of this preacher and I'll look a sinner straight in the eyes. I'll do it tonight. And I'll go, what's your name? And he'll go, my name is Joe. You can tell he's away from God, never knew the Lord maybe. And I'll say, Joe, my name's Steve, man. I love you, buddy. Thanks for coming. First time here? Yeah, man. Come with your friend? Yeah. First time? Yeah, man. How'd you hear about it? Work? Welcome. Welcome. Listen, you're supposed to be here. You're supposed to be here. God's got a plan for your life, Joe. He's got a plan. Love it on him. Because I know in just a minute I'm going to be preaching on the wrath of God. <laughs> so I better get Joe on my side. <laughs> you love on him, friend. You care about him. That's how you break up the fallow ground. You turn it, friend. Tears are so helpful during this time. Planting the seed. Planting the seed. Pastors, I am an evangelist, okay? I do not claim to be a Dick Rubin. Dick Rubin is a teacher. I'm not a teacher. I'm an evangelist. And all the old books that I've got in my library that were written by evangelists or about evangelists is all evangelists had basically a simple sermon. God loves you, has a plan for your life, won't you come? <laughs> you know? There's a heaven, there's a hell. You're going to burn or you're going to live with God forever. You know, just basic stuff. D.L. Moody sermons. Pablum, baby food. George Whitfield, baby food. 
And why did the masses come to them? Because we're all little children, friends. We're all a bunch of kids. But here's the problem. Here's what happens. You come in here. Pastors, you have no direction in your message. I'm talking right now about planting the seed. What do you want to get across? Tonight, I know where I'm going. I'm not out to impress anybody. And the people that need to be impressed don't need to be impressed anyhow. I mean, they're just, if you've got somebody out there always taking notes with your sermon, then later on going, Pastor, you know, you said Jeremiah 21.3, it's Jeremiah 21.4. And actually, when Jeremiah said this, he really meant this, you know. You know what I tell those folks? Would you do me a favor? <laughs> Would you go down to Skid Row and win someone to Jesus? Just one person. Would you go do something for God besides sit in here all day long and critique me? But here's what we do. We get out there, pastors. We get out there. We have no direction. I'm talking about an evangelistic focus in your ministry. What are you going after? Do you want souls saved in your church? Do you want a revival meeting? Then if you have an evangelist in and he gets up and he begins teaching the crowd, pull him aside and say, you're not here to do that. You're here to preach to seven-year-olds. And if you'll touch a seven-year-old, you'll touch a 70-year-old. I want to tell you something else. Your congregation will love him. They eat up the simple messages. They'll eat it up as long as they're preached with compassion and love. But here's what we do. I've got a bag of seeds right here, okay? I got spinach, squash, carrots, lettuce, beets, okras, radish, zucchini, peas, collards, mustard, cucumbers, beans, and corn all mixed up in one bag. This is how some of us preach. We go, oh, come to Jesus. Come to Jesus. Come to Jesus. Here, come to Jesus. This is how we preach, friend. I'm telling you the truth. We have no direction. Try, try to harvest that. Try to harvest that. Now, I've never done that, probably never be able to do that again now. <laughs> those maids are going to be in here, those workers. But let me tell you something, friend. If you're preaching cucumbers, preach cucumbers, would you? Okay? If you're preaching beets, preach beets. Whatever you were planting out there, would you just plant it? We have folks, man, I've heard preachers, they're, they're trying to evangelize. They go whoop off here and then whoop off there. And the sinner's out there going, oh, they're seasick, man. They don't know where you're going. So stick with the point. Stick with your point. And when it comes harvest time, when it comes time 30, 40 minutes later, when you give the altar call, you can say, now I've just been talking to you about this. They go, you know, you have. That's all. You stuck on that all night. I understood that. But some of them are just, they're off everywhere trying to figure out what you said and how it relates to what you just said and how the next point's going to relate to that point. And friend, does this make sense to anybody in this room? Planting the seed. I mean, when I walked around here one night, and I, illustrations, I use them every now and then. I'm going to touch base on this. But I walked around here one night with an axe. It was a broad axe. I hardly ever use illustrations, by the way. Illustrations will steal your anointing. Pastors don't ever trade an illustration for the anointing. Don't ever do that. One pastor came to me and said he spent $10,000 one night of a large church on one illustration to get a point across. And I grieved. I said, wow, I could build a church in Russia for that. <laughs> you know, $10,000 to get a point across. I'm not against any illustrations. I didn't say that. But be careful, would you? Be careful. Illustrations will ruin the anointing or they'll be mightily used of God. Jesus used them. But I walked around here one night. I preached on the, the he will cut you down. That was the name of the message. Cut you down about the owner of the vineyard that's got this tree that's not bearing forth fruit. And the, the, the keeper of the vineyard comes in and says, give me a year. Give me one more year and I'll turn the soil. I'll fertilize it. I'll water it. One more year. Well, I got a broad axe, a 120-year-old broad axe, a huge thing. It looks like a Grim Reaper type of axe. It's an antique. It's all rusty. It looks like a killer weapon, you know, and walked around the congregation and looked at people and said, Sir, how do you know 
that this ain't the end of the year. <laughs> he will cut you down. And friend, they understood, man. <laughs> there wasn't a doubt in anybody's mind. Pastor, you, was there? Did anybody have a doubt? What I was talking about that night. Make sure you're planting that seed, the same thing. Friend, the same thing. Watering the seed, number five. We're closing out. This is spiritual irrigation. You planted the seed, you turned the soil, you planted the seed, now you gotta water it. You water it once again, if you're taking notes, water it with your tears, and you can't turn tears off and on, but when they come, don't grit your teeth. Look at me, everybody. I've got a book coming out from Huntington House called A Time to Weep. And it's all about tears. The whole book is about tears. And one of the chapters in there is called Big Boys Don't Cry. And it's this lie that's been implanted in us for years that we don't cry. Pastors, cry like a baby. Squall because everybody out there even the, the Stoics that say they can't not shed a tear, they show no emotion. You stick them in a dark theater somewhere watching a tear-jerking story, and right when it comes to that point where everybody's going, <laughs> flip the lights on, and you watch that Stoic crying. He's going, <laughs> just like that. So don't be afraid to cry. Water the seed with your tears. And also, this is where the illustrations come in. I'll use an illustration towards the end of the sermon, towards the end of the mes message, something simple to take more water to that seed that I just planted. And I'll just dig a trench. I'll drag my ax and dig the trench. <laughs> and I'll come right up to him with the ax and I'll say, you know, he'll cut you down. You're putting more water on the seed that you just planted. Where are you going with that message, friend? Use an illustration one night. And I'm not lifting up the preaching, friend. I'm just saying this is what gets results with people that don't know what's going on. Did you know most of the people that get saved in these meetings don't have a clue? They don't know what it means to live for God. We had an Episcopalian woman saved one night. She said, I've been in church. Am I telling the truth? 18 years, all her life. She was baptized in the, in the pool up there. She said, I've been in church all my life. I've never known the Lord. Never known the Lord. Now, how do you reach somebody like that? How do you reach... You plant that seed, friend, and then you irrigate it. Remember, they're out there. They're out there when revival breaks out. You, you irrigate, you, you dig that trench all the way back to them, and maybe with an illustration, you, you, you water that thing. You water that seed. Does this make sense to anybody? I'm trying. Watch for growth. Understand levels of maturity. Remember, people are at all levels of growth. As you're preaching, there are many who have gone from a hard, heart to a believing heart but they went from the hard heart to the believing heart at the beginning of your message they grew you you took that seed friend you threw it out there and it went in the soil and within five minutes some of them were already ready because Linda let them in worship and you're looking out there and there's a hard rocky core person right here just hard as rock over here and right over there there's a plant blossoming ready to get saved Watch for growth. I want to tell you a, a key, friends, in evangelistic preaching. This is, I'm talking just on evangelistic preaching. I'm not talking teaching tonight. This is evangelistic preaching. I'll look out sometime in the congregation, and I'll see somebody just broken, broken. I'll walk right up to them. And I'll put my hand on their shoulder in front of thousands of people. I'll go, God's speaking to you, man. In just a minute, I'm going to call everybody forward. I want you to come on up. You gonna come on up? They go, yeah. Yeah, why? It's a plant already, man. Full bloom, bearing fruit. <laughs> and there's somebody that's right down, maybe sitting next to that person. It's so hard. So you gotta remember, they're all there, friend. All the way through your message. There are all kinds of levels of growth. That's why tonight when I give this altar call, you're gonna see me. Give, I'll give several altar calls. I'll throw the net out, pull it in. And by the way, when we throw the net out, can I share this? When we throw the net out, we're after sinners. But pastors, one of the words that we don't use is rededication. We don't use rededication because America rededicates itself every week. We tell folks that they are sinners. 
Because we one time I had a pastor right here get saved, came to the meeting. Pastor's a large church up north. And he was standing right here. He had his pastor's badge on. And I began to pray with him. I just walked down because he was a pastor, came forward for the altar call. I thought, you know, something fishy was going on. What's wrong, you know? He was a well-dressed man. And, and I, I knew the guy had some class to him, you know, and I started praying for him, you know. I thought, what's going on? Maybe there's a deep church problem. He just came forward for prayer. And he stopped me in the middle of the prayer. He said, Steve, I'm a sinner, man. And he named the sin he was involved in. Nobody knew it. But it was hideous. He was a sinner away from God. And oh, how easy it is, friends, for us to miss that. It's so easy for us to miss that. You don't know what's going on in people's hearts. I can prove that in just a second when I close. And work until the harvest is in. We call that running the combine at night with the lights on. How many have seen that out in the fields? That's what this revival is. We're running the combines at night, and we'll, we'll take that, the net, and we'll rake it through that crowd several times. Just keep raking it through. And you, tonight, you'll see maybe 100 or so come forward the first call, and then the second call, I'll call them out there again, and people sometimes run to the altar. We have all kinds of altar calls here, friends. Some of them will blow you away. Others, you just scratch your head. You can't figure out what's going on inside people's hearts. Some people run, and they've hit this thing. I thought they killed themselves. They hit it so hard. But at the very end, I'm talking about running the combine. We'll run the combine through to glean the field, and then we'll go out. It's still night, you know, in a lot of people's lives, but there's some fruit out there. There's some people that want to come forward but I remember a cult member back there. She had never been in a church. She didn't know what an altar call was, man. Watch your lingo, friends. When you look out there, you don't know those people. I tell them, an altar call is where everyone confesses what's going on inside their heart. They, they confess Jesus Christ is dealing with their hearts. You got to get up. Jesus hung on the cross naked for you. Why can't you get up and come down here? And I'll use the illustration. If I had $1,000... And I said, anybody that wants a thousand dollars, come up here and grab this roll of money. We got one for everyone in this church that wants a thousand dollars. Some of those folks that are back there that would not come forward for salvation will get up in front of everybody and walk and grab that money. Where your treasure is, there your heart is. And I'll tell them, so tell them, you come up here to get this thousand dollars but you won't come up here and give your life to Christ and confess Christ? Get real. You're a jellyfish, man. You're spineless. You're a liar, man. You get up here and say, I need Jesus. And that, we've run in the combine through. And then I'll go out there with a flashlight. <laughs> I mean, I'll go around and I'll know you're out there, man. I remember one night I took the Bible let me just have a, the word. Somebody got a Bible right here close? Preachers, one Bible. <laughs> but I, I, I just went through the altar call. And these, every one of these are spontaneous. I don't have a book on all this. This is just stuff that happens. But the Lord spoke to me. I promise to tell the whole truth, nothing but the truth, so help me God. I said, I'm going to walk by with this Bible. If you're lying... If you're not right with God, you better run as fast as you can before this book gets here. <laughs> Man, I'll never forget that one. <laughs> Lord, have mercy. People freaked. Why? Because 93 of Americans have this book in their home. 90, you got that in your favor, pastors. 93% of America's households have this book in their home. 85% believe that Jesus Christ was the Son of God. So deep down inside, when you start waving this book in front of them, say, don't you lie, man. Do you know the Lord? Do you know the Lord? Friends, that's a flashlight going, <laughs> where'd this come from? Okay, we're going to close. Pastor, I apologize for all them seeds down there. Let me tell you, try to do that. Go get yourself about 20 kinds of seeds and plant them out in the garden. Try to harvest that thing. 
That's why you're having such a hard time coming with altar call. You know, carrot here, beet here, lettuce here, a big old head of lettuce killing a carrot, you know? In closing tonight, this morning, on preaching correctly, I'm going to take five minutes with this. Here's how I approach every night. And we don't have the answers, friends. Look at me, man. We don't have all the answers. We stumble on all this. We stumble on it. But my, I have a heart for souls. I want to see people saved. America needs to hear about judgment. They need to hear about the wrath of God. They need to hear about hell. Why is heaven's gates and hell's flames such a success? Because they want to hear about hell. They want to hear about hell, friends. America's been loved into a lull. God loves you, God loves you, God loves you, God loves you. Yes, but a loving Savior will one day be a severe judge. <laughs> one day he will judge you. But preaching correctly, here's what I do. Before I come in here every night, and I'm closing with this. I take three looks at my own sinfulness. How many here will testify that you've had sinful thoughts just about every day of your life? Raise your hand. The rest of you are lying. I'm gonna, I can prove it to you. See that wall right there? Let's do this. Every thought negative sinful thought that went through your mind every man woman and child in this place over the last two or three days maybe a glance man at a woman and a thought went shooting through your head woman maybe a glance at a man and this lustful thought went through your head and you you just turned your head you turned it but it was there maybe an envious thought maybe a hateful thought maybe something like I cannot stand that man I don't like the way that man talks. I don't like the way that woman looks. If everything that went through your heart, through your mind, was written on that wall, let's say over the last few hours, okay, let's nail it down, was written on that wall, and your name was signed to the bottom of it. Your name was signed to the bottom of it. I believe everyone in this room would crawl out of this room. Now, Pastor, if you don't get to that place where you're honest with yourself, you're never going to touch these people. They need to see a real man, a real woman that's been set free by the power of God. But you're a common man. You're still flesh and blood. You deal with these things. Jesus said, Peter, you thought it, son. You've committed it. We look so pious, friend. I look at my own sinfulness every night. So every single night I preach to myself. I preach to myself what I have been going through, what I have gone through, and I know I am as common as everyone in this room. So deal with that, pastors. Look at your own sinfulness. Then look at the depth of human wretchedness all around you. Think that everything that you're going through, everyone else is going through. And you're going to see how hopeless the situation is. And the last one, look at the love of God in Christ Jesus. He will set us free. He will forgive us everything that we're going through. After I do that, I can look at myself. I'm empty. You know, I'm not some pious preacher up here screaming at folks. I'm a broken man preaching to broken men. I can just talk to them, say, listen, there's coming a day, man or you're going to be judged. I'm going to be judged. You're going to be judged. Rather than screaming at them and hollering at them like you're some perfect person, you'll be full of compassion towards those around you. Hallelujah. There's probably some announcements. I don't know, are there? I want everyone to stand, if you would. We're going to close, and I think, do they have all the information on the lunch, what's going on?
Okay, speakers, conference speakers, you're in room 100 for lunch. Would you do us all a favor tonight? First of all, we want everyone to be in the meeting tonight. Everyone to be in the meeting tonight. But last night, because of the magnitude, see, every night in this revival, this place is packed without any pastors, with just people coming from all over. Last night, a lot of folks came and were ushered, they were, they were told to go somewhere else in the building, and some of those folks were brand new. Some of them had driven for miles, others had come across town, and it's, it's, we've always had a space problem here, okay? And we always will, but we're never gonna move this to a civic center, we're never gonna move it to some field somewhere. This, was, this revival broke out in a local church, and I love people getting saved in a local church. It's beautiful. So do us a favor tonight, come, and if you come a little bit late, just sit wherever there's a seat. And remember, we're letting everyone in, okay? And so, because we want to make sure everyone gets an opportunity tonight. I don't want anyone to be turned away because they haven't registered for the conference. And, and if, if you do not get the seat that you want, please don't leave. Stay with us, okay? You, say if you're in the chapel. The chapel is a wonderful place to be. There's nothing wrong with that at all. You may have sinners sitting right next to you that need your presence there. They need you. So work with us. We're not changing the revival service because of the pastor's conference. We want you to see what an evening service is. But it's difficult for this evangelist. It is hard for me when there's no room for folks that have never known the Lord. So I'm not saying don't come and sit in this sanctuary. Come. But all, we are going to be squeezed in. Okay? We're going to fill this place up. And when the altar call is given, God's going to speak to some of you. I'm going to begin now. God's going to speak to some of you. Some of you in this room are so far from God, it's scary. It is scary. I'm scared for you, man. You're away from the Lord. And you came to this conference, and so far you have enjoyed it, but God has not dealt with that root problem in your life. Today, before the, before the clock strikes 12, you're going to be totally set free from that thing that's been eating you alive. God's going to set you free. He's going to restore you, friend. I know it's going to happen. He brought you here. So whatever you do, do not miss tonight's service. God bless you. that come are simple. Steve, from the top of his sermon to the bottom of it, he's given one long altar call. And I'll tell you what, the Holy Spirit knows that. And I know there's places, other places in America where this is happening too, I'm sure. But Holy Spirit knows that every night that old combine's in the field with the headlights on getting in the harvest. And Holy Spirit will put people under conviction and draw them here people that wouldn't even dare think about church six months ago. And friend, let me tell you something else. If we would have shut this thing down, if it broke out in June, and we shut this thing down in July, think of the thousands of souls we'd have missed. Let me tell you how this revival broke out. It broke out on Father's Day. We came back that night. The place was packed that night because word circulated quickly. God broke out at Brownsville. And Steve and I said, well, you want to go on another night? We took it one night at a time and said, well, as long as the people come, are you willing, John, to come? I said, Steve, are you willing to preach? Are you willing to be here and let's both come? He said, yeah. I'm not getting paid a dime extra for being here every night at this revival, but we're here for souls. This worship team that comes up here, they're not getting paid a dime extra. The ushers, not getting paid a dime. This worship team don't even get paid. The ushers don't get paid. We're here every night for souls. So what's happening here is we've got two things happening. We've got souls coming in that God is using the evangelists to get souls in, and he's using me to pastor them and to love them. Before we go, would you take your Bibles just a minute? Let me show you one scripture. I want to show you something real quick. Turn to Ecclesiastes. I'll tell you something the Holy Spirit showed me. Ecclesiastes, 
chapter 4. Now, let me explain something to you real quick before we go. Before revival broke out, I remember where I was. I was in my backyard, and the Holy Spirit come to me and spoke something to my heart. And he said to me, are you willing to share your church? Now, this is months before revival broke out. He said, are you willing to share your church and take a different role and let me have my way. And I said to him instantly, yes, sir, I am. I said, Lord, you do whatever you want to do. I don't understand what you're saying. There's a man here today. He, first time he ever gave me a prophecy, I, I put him on hold because I've been giving prophecies down through the years. And, uh, you know, I got to where I, the scripture came to pass in my life where it says despise not prophesying. I got to where I despise prophecies because I hear so much, you know, and it'd just be sensational and fanatical, and I got to where I'd cringe when anybody tried to give me a prophecy. But this guy gave me one, and it came to pass, so I began to listen to him. He gave me another one, and that one came to pass, and I began to listen to him, and I believe that God's got his hand on him as a, uses him as a true, to speak into, into somebody's life, and he spoke into mine twice, and it came to pass, so he, he called me, and he didn't know anything, and I didn't even say a word to my wife or his soul. And he said, Brother Kilpatrick, he said, the Holy Spirit wanted me to share this with you. He said, uh, I want you to be able to receive it. He said, Holy Spirit says your ministry is going to change, but you're going to stay at the same place. And I thought, okay. That was a confirmation to me. So then the Lord gave me this scripture, and he said he's going to make this church a prototype. You all listening? I want you to hear me. The Lord said he's going to make this church a prototype. When it first broke out, he said, I'm going to make it a prototype. And here's the scripture that he gave me. It's uh, Ecclesiastes 4 and uh, verse 9. It says, two are better than one because they have a good reward for their labor. For if they fall, the one will lift up his fellow. But woe to him that is alone when he falleth, for he hath not another to help him up. Again, if two lie together, then they have heat. But how can one be warm alone? And if one prevails against him, two shall withstand him, and the threefold cord is not quickly broken. And I found out in this revival something strange happened. Whenever Steve, God sent him here to do the evangelistic work, he's, I, don't, I don't covet what he does. He's, he's strictly an evangelist. I'll tell you the truth of the matter. He's, he's uncomfortable having all preachers here tonight because there's not any sinners here. Sinners light his fire. You preachers, he loves you, but my forte is, is to deal with preachers. And God spoke to my heart at the offset of revival and said he was going to make me a pastor to pastors. So this is my forte. I love this. Steve loves it too. But if there's not a sinner in the house, he's like a fish out of water. He don't know what to do. I mean, he ain't got no hatchet. <laughs> he ain't got no flashlight. He's miserable. And uh, so... He does a tremendous job as an evangelist. I don't covet what he does, and he doesn't covet what I do. I can't do what he does, and he can't do what I do. And then God sent Dick Rubin here, the big, ugly Jew. Where's he at? There he is. I mean, the big Jew. I didn't mean that. Big Jew. And uh, God sent Dick Rubin here. Dick Rubin is a dear friend of mine. I have all the confidence in the world in him. We kid each other. But uh, God sent him here. It's three full cord. And... The Lord put us together, and we, what we find out is we come under a terrible assault of hell in this revival. You wouldn't believe the assault. There's been nights me and Steve both walked up here on this platform, didn't even hardly know our name under such assault. I mean, demonic attack. See, we're having people from the New Age get saved, witches, warlocks, prostitutes, pimps, drug pushers. They're coming. They're getting saved. Hell don't like it. I tell you, this revival is table talking hell. He knows what's going on. And don't think he's going to sit around and twiddle his thumbs and let us get by with what we're doing. I mean, he's fighting us. But you see, if I was in this thing alone, he'd hit me in the pit of the belly and knock the wind out of me, see. But I got Steve, and he's got me. He looks to me a lot when he's preaching for encouragement. I strengthen him. I look to him a lot on the platform. He strengthens me. And Dick Rubin carries us both. 
But what the Lord said was, listen, when revival comes to your church, pastors, don't be afraid to let go to a point and welcome maybe a God-sent evangelist to your church to help you. You see, maybe God's trying to relieve you a little bit. Maybe God wants you to love on the sheep and, and pastor them, but maybe God might want to place an evangelist with you, maybe a trusted friend. It'd have to be a, a tried and proven vessel. And we don't know how long this thing's going to last. It's gone on now for 10 and a half months. We're working toward a year in Father's Day. We don't know how long it's going to go on. But I can foresee it going on maybe even till the year 2000 or longer. I, I can foresee that. But you know what? Maybe, just maybe, it might go on to the year 2000. Or it might go on till maybe November, December, and it might be over. It might be over. Who knows? Or it might go on until Jesus comes. But don't be afraid if Holy Spirit's trying to open your church up. Maybe he's speaking to somebody here right now. But you can't just have anybody in because it have to be somebody that's submitted. It's Brother, uh, Brother Steve is submitted. We talk everything over. There's not one. Th we, don't even, we don't even come to the pulpit without looking at one another and saying, hey, what do you think? We don't come up here each night with an agenda. We don't have anything written down. We just come up here and wing it every service. And if God wants to start doing healing, He'll look at me and say, you want to take it? And I say, you take it? He said, no, you take it. So I will jump up here and just, I mean, wide open, man. Let God just begin to do what God wants to do. It's his services. So I tell you, I love it. It's wonderful. Revival. Me and my wife drives home a lot of nights, and we look at one another and say, honey, can you believe this? Hey, aren't we having the time of our life? Hey. Are we being fought by hell? Sure, but you're going to be fought by hell anyway. I mean, I face it. You're going to be fought by hell anyway. Might as well get the most mileage out of it, amen? <laughs> hey, look, if you're going to make the devil mad, poke him in both eyes, bless God. Amen. God bless you.